Imagine a notebook. Anything you write in it, and it's coming to life. Second now. Scribble Nuts, probably one of the most ambitious and interesting game franchises to come out in recent times, if you consider 2009 recent, that is. All right, listen, we're getting old, okay, deal with it. The concept was simple. Write anything you want to Maxwell's magical notebook and bam, it comes to life. Well, it might sound overly ambitious. No, you can literally type anything and everything and it will show up. You know what the freaking justice of the peace? Go for it. In 2009 on the Nintendo DS, a project like this was wild over 22,000 words could be summoned. Now, there were some restrictions, of course. You can't type swear words, I tried. No brands were allowed and no people. Except Michael Jackson for some reason. He's there. I think Scribblenauts is interesting because this franchise would have totally taken a different turn if smartphones came out even a year or two earlier than they did, in my opinion. The iPhone was, of course, out and somewhat relevant at the time, but iOS games didn't really take off until the early 2010s, and you have to factor in development time, of course, too. So hey, the technology wasn't entirely there or modernized yet, so here's our good old friend, the Nintendo DS. Oh, I love the DS. PictoChat on the school bus, games that wanted you to use the touchscreen to replace analog Movement. I'm glad this didn't last. Pokemon was actually good, and those were the days, man. I spent countless hours on this thing, and so did millions of people. 154 millions, to be exact. Actually, 154.02 oh. millions. All right, you get the idea. The touchscreen of the Nintendo DS was the biggest selling point, and for good reason. It gave way to a completely different form of gaming that really wasn't seen before, except in the GameCom, but I'm just gonna revise history and pretend that piece of crap never came out. Is, it a, is that a deal? Are we good with that? Some games used it for map stuff, some put the action on both screens, some helped you quit smoking, and of course, Scribblenauts would use it to have the players bring their very imaginations to life. Scribblenauts was created by Jeremiah Salagza under the company Fifth Cell. Previously, Fifth Cell were known for the THQ published DS game, Drawn to Life, which was a pretty cool idea, letting you draw your own protagonist, solutions to puzzles. I remember playing this game quite a bit as a kid, and it would go on to get a handful of games, and hey, you gotta hand it to Fifth Cell for trying to make some original franchises. So Put this team up at Sony or Microsoft. They need it. Nowadays, Fifth Cell has mostly died out, but they did come back in 2021 to make a castle hold for the PC. It's like, I'm not trying to be mean, but this kind of just looks like uh, Fortnite, Overwatch, just every modern game thrown into a blender. Where's the special pizzazz, you know? Like, this company used to be so unique. But hey, you gotta respect the team for setting out to create original products back then. Even in the late 2000s, that's a big risk. Nowadays, something original is usually made as an indie game with less of a budget, and that's partially because of companies like EA, Activision, Ubisoft, they wanna know it'll sell before they fund it. But no, Drawn to Life and Scribblenauts were fully-fledged original titles with a genuine budget. No digital release, no frills, legitimate new games with innovative ideas. And I'm going so far into this because Scribblenauts directly came from developers refusing Using to work on a licensed game. THQ, after the success of Drawn to Life, wanted Fifth Cell to work on their licensed games. Jeremiah would say, well, we don't really do licensed titles, to which THQ responded with, what are you talking about? You know, THQ actually is a point because uh, Fifth Cell kind of made a few licensed phone titles. I don't exactly know what they're talking about. All jokes aside, the money earned from Drawn to Life would lead the developers to a position where they could craft and develop their next original game, which would begin development in 2008. This game was based off of a concept where you could write sentences on the DS's touchscreen, where in the top screen, a story based off of that sentence would come alive. Now, of course, that's quite simple of an idea, not really a game, but as a film student, if I've learned anything, it's that this is fairly normal, even with the movies. Good ideas often stem from a brief thought, a big blockbuster movie could start being written on a napkin. And as it would be shortly after, Jeremiah would go on to theorize a normal adventure puzzle game, but wanting to give it some juice would merge these two concepts together. Fifth Cell would self-fund it, with Jeremiah citing not wanting publishers to freak out and not have any faith in the product. So, you know, well, you could, you would, you said, uh, you can make a game that you could do anything. Uh, yeah. yeah. Alright, enough yapping, let's just play the game. You control Maxwell, such an adorable character, look at this guy. The original DS title had some very awkward stylist controls, but we're playing this on Scribblenauts Collection today, a title that combined the first two games and added D-pad support to the first game, which is the definitive way to play this game in my opinion. It still gives you an option if you want to control Maxwell with the stylist, but why not give me an option at that point to jump off a damn cliff? 
I and many others have always found the D-pad to control the character suits the game best, with using the B button and jump and all. I mean, this is a side-scroller. I should note this is one of the biggest problems with the first release, uh, so I am aware of that and just wanted to mention it so we don't leave it out of the big picture. But with the advent of this collection and it being fairly cheap online, there's really no reason to play the original, so I consider the issue rectified in a way. But no matter what, we still have to use the stylus for some mechanics, like the notepad. Well, duh. All right, which item should we spawn? I'm just gonna enter something stupid, like a, 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 a poo. Eh, yeah, Pyro's close enough. Oh shit! This game doesn't necessarily get off on the best foot. There's an extremely long tutorial. Seriously, there are 11 levels here, each with a load in and load out. We learn about some of the other touching mechanisms here. Sh should, I, should I have reverted that? Yeah, it's fine. You tap a ladder to climb it, you tap to use a hammer to knock down a piece of wood, the whole kit and caboodle. The magnifying glass in the top right identifies objects, which is actually super helpful, believe it or not. And the disembodied Maxwell head will snap the camera back to you at any point. This is super convenient convenient because often you'll be using the touchscreen to move the camera. To finish a level, Maxwell must collect the star right, this game's version of, you, you know, stars. Yeah, it's not that good of a name, deal with it. You might think with the amount you have to switch between tapping and using the d-pad, maybe the control scheme would still be a bit too much, but you get used to it, it works really well. But yeah, I said, this tutorial goes on for just about forever. I, I get it, it's a new game, new idea, they don't want anyone to be lost, but it's a bit much. I think I would have just preferred if this game let you figure out some things by yourself, or better yet, just have everything in one simple level. Once you get out of tutorial hell and into world one, you have two options for how you can move forward in this game. You see, each world actually has two different sets of 10 or so levels. One set is for the puzzles, and one set is for action-oriented levels. Puzzle levels are more based on thinking about logical solutions, something like Farmer Billy Bob needs some animals here, simple stuff. What would a farmer want? Money and friends. Another level may make you dress up in a costume to fit in at a party or giving an apple to a teacher. You know what? I, I actually don't understand this one. Like, why do teachers like apples so much? Where did this stereotype even come from? The action levels will typically be more combat oriented or require Maxwell to experiment with buttons, switches, and more mechanical items of that nature. World 4 8, for instance, is kind of like an Indiana Jones parody. You gotta distract these people from attacking you, then sneak past a group of monkeys. Take your stinking paws off that star right, you damn dirty apes! Another puzzle level is you're shooting ducks. Oh yeah, I've seen this somewhere before. I think the biggest issue with this system is that while it's really good on paper, get it? I didn't even intend for that. The biggest issue is that the action and puzzle levels really blend together, like to the point where the choice doesn't actually have that much gravity to it. All right, step right up everyone, let's play a game here. It is a puzzle level or an action level. Swim through enemy infested waters, transporting important cargo from point A to point B. If you guessed action, you'd be wrong, go screw yourself. All right, rescuing stranded soldiers from evil men and submarines hanging from ropes. Yeah, yeah, this is this is this is also kind of a puzzle level. I think this game's rationality for separating puzzle and action levels is based more so on whether you spawn a star right versus having the star right already be present. The puzzle levels require an action to spawn it, while the action levels are just about getting from point A to point B. I, I kind of get what they were going for. It's an okay concept, but the functionality of whether or not the star right actually spawns or not isn't always contingent on solving anything. You know what I mean? You basically do the same thing, just in one you lose a few seconds waiting for the star right to spawn. This system had potential, but it ultimately wasn't realized that well. It's not always like this. There still are a good amount of puzzle missions that require you to really sit there and think about what particular items would be best. But on the other hand, there are quite a bit of levels that basically are the same sort of thing. There's a lot of levels where it's just like, carry an object from point A to point B, you win. Well, around this topic, here's my recommendations of items you should be using in this game. The jetpack, oh my goodness. You can type in wings, I think, for basically the same function, but yeah, I use the jetpack on basically 50% of my missions. It lets you subvert gravity, of course, meaning a lot of levels could be outright cheesed with it. The re-release gives you some more fuel, I believe, but regardless of version, I would always use this in the original plenty of times too. This thing was used more than my textbooks as a kid. For the move an object level, if I needed to bring an object with me, my trick was I would type glue with a rope. You can also use like tape and bam, you're on the Jeff Compass Express, we don't have barf bags, all right, deal with it. Similarly, if you're worried about like a star right falling, sometimes they'll be attached to ropes or something, bird and glue. Now that, it's actually kind of creative, but it can be used quite often is the problem. Black hole, oh, I love this item. Type it, put it next to something you want to subject to spaghettification, it dies. It's certainly a solution to your life problems. Sharks and bears work as well if you need to take out just one or two animals, and hey, you know, that's a little more eco-friendly than, um, than, than ending the world just a, just a bit. Although, so to, so to, so this thing, if you need something with a little more juice to it, 
can be a pretty good item as well to attack other enemies with. I'd say I use one of, if not more, of these terms in 70% of my levels I played. I should note that for my playthrough, I did switch between puzzle and action levels for every other world. I did the reverse of some worlds too later just to see a few levels, but I technically didn't play every single level to get to the end. It wasn't required. So that 70% I said might change, give or take, but in this maybe 130 levels I played for this playthrough, yeah, you're doing this a lot. At least you can loop some items. I think it's a bit of a shame, because I gotta give credit to the developers, they made an incredible expansive notebook system. Seriously, this database is stupidly impressive, especially considering the DS cartridge sizes. But you just end up doing the same things quite a bit. And speaking to the number of items again, some objects are a bit repetitive. Not everything has its own unique model, which is kind of a way they get around the magnitude of this project. For instance, the words woman and mom spawn the same character model, even though there's technically a difference, of course. Also, if you type virgin and gamer, it spawns the same model. Okay, that's actually really funny. Can't add adjectives either. If you try to do it, it'll cross out the adjective and just give you the base word. I, I, it's an understandable restriction, especially for the first game. But to give the team credit, there are a lot of objects with legitimate functions. My goodness, a lot of things that I think probably took at least a few hours of development for one item. For instance, you can type in a time machine, taking you to sort of an ancient kingdom. I don't know why this level is called zero. One, I'm guessing to transport you, they needed some kind of like placeholder or something. And I don't know if you can actually get a star right here. I didn't see any obvious puzzles. You can also enter night vision goggles, giving you a filter for this level. This looks like a Game Boy game. Anyone want to play some Tetris? There are some Easter eggs. Like if you type Maxwell, you get an evil version of yourself. And Scribble Knots spawns uh, whatever this is. You can even spawn the game developer, Jeremiah. All right, explain yourself. Why did you make the same level like 30 times? In the beta, there were even some Konami models in there, but they were cut from the final version, which is understandable, but how cool would that have been to spawn like Solid Snake or something? You can even spawn some good old late 2000s memes. Ah, these never get old. Spawning Rick Astley makes him, uh, die. Never gonna give you. <laughs> and of course, you don't need to be in a level to mess around with a notebook. You can do this in the game's open sandboxes. There are quite a bit to unlock, and I gotta say, as a kid, this is where I spent most of my time with this game, just thinking day in and day out what dumb stuff I could create, what crazy situations I could think of. Seriously, there are thousands of options, and the possibilities for these scenarios are endless. It's basically its own game. Which is just why I find the levels to be kind of underwhelming. I found my creativity that I had here wasn't always put to the test. Like, sure, I could have maybe said, all right, let's not use the jetpack on this one. But at least me as a player, if I know there's an obvious solution, well, I'd rather just do that. I don't want to be sitting there making my life any harder. Besides, for some of these, I don't know what you even do besides the old jetpack and rope technique. Like, the game doesn't give you a lot of options. Some of the levels were very frustrating in the sense that you need a very particular item to progress. Take 210's puzzle stage, for instance. The chef wants a hot meal, so I figured it out. I don't know, soup? Soup is pretty warm. Like, what's warmer than soup, right? But this wouldn't work. I get it's technically a liquid, but I still thought this should count. Moments like this happen somewhat often, and I do get it. I think what's happening here is each developer who makes a particular level has their own biases and what should count and what shouldn't. After all, we're all humans. They're probably just thinking exactly what they're thinking, and there's so many possibilities, so it's only natural. But yeah, I do wish the solutions weren't super restricted, as it would often have me second-guessing myself if I was even doing the level right in the first place. Another example of this was 410's action level where you race against a leprechaun to a star, Right. You can't win just by racing him, as far as I know. At first I thought, hey, why don't we just try to distract him or something? A pot of gold. Leprechauns like gold, right? I mean, who doesn't? Apparently, star rights are worth more than sheer gold. He just cuts the gold with a knife. Pure gold destroyed with a damn knife. What? Well, it turns out this wasn't the viable solution. The game developers want you to slow him down in some other form. All right, let's put a wall. Nope, he breaks that as well. What kind of knife does this guy have? It just breaks through everything. All right, uh, let's just try a bear. I mean, what else am I supposed to do, right? Let's just let's just spawn a bear. O okay, that that worked. Okay, he's dead. I mean, he's he's literally dead. But now you can play. So the developers just wanted you to like uh, kill this guy. But what really sucks is a level in the next world, another race level. If you bring out the bear, then nope. Suddenly that is cheating. I really don't get why they would change the rules like that. Like. I agree, using a bear is cheap, but it was my only choice against Leprechaun. What else was I supposed to do? And if you allow it in one level, why'd you ban it in another? I think this type of missing continuity, never knew what I could do and couldn't do. And now the wall works. 
I don't understand my life anymore. To combat the lack of puzzling moments, the developers actually added quite a bit of replay value as a way to remedy this a bit. Upon beating Lala, you can re-enter it and try to beat it three times in a row, with the only caveat being that you can't use new words on each attempt. Well, this doesn't fix everything, as wings and small planes can be alternatives to jetpacks, and tape and glue can be rope alternatives. This still adds quite a bit of depth to this game, and is an addition I really appreciate. Thinking about it now, my god, if you factor getting in the advanced star rights, along with the fact that each world has puzzle and action levels, this game literally has more content, like half of the games that are released in this day and age. How do they cram all this on a cartridge the size of a Cheez-It? On top of that, this game does keep a type of score system, if you're into that sort of thing. There's a par which gives a recommended amount of items to use per stage. It's often pretty fair, and not too hard to play either close to or even under, although sometimes I just say screw it and spawn a few dozen items to win. Hey look, it's technically not cheating, alright? Don't make me feel bad! The only downside of not following the par system is that you earn less allers. No, I didn't say that wrong, it's allers, not dollars. It's kinda weird, but it's better than coins or some millionth variation of currency every other game has. It's memorable, for sure. There are a few other variables that determine your score and therefore the aller count. There's style. I won't lie, I don't know what this was for my entire playthrough, I have no clue what triggers it. I did some research, and the only thing I could find was an old GameSpot forums post with people just as confused as I am. King of Donkey says different merits get you different amount of style points. Example, Savior gets you 10 style points. I think this is related to the merits, which are the in-game achievements. So basically, if you win an achievement, you get more style points, but I don't know, if the King of Donkeys can't explain it perfectly, then hell is about to freeze over, alright? There's also a time variable factoring into your score, although on a first playthrough, I recommend kind of ignoring that. You don't want to rush yourself in my opinion, so I personally never worried about this system too much, and even the system as a whole. On subsequent playthroughs though, it's a genius way to bolster replay value, and means that not every level is just a matter of cheesing it. They want you to win it in a creative way. If you want to play the game the way they want, you are rewarded for it, and I think that's my favorite part about this game. All playstyles, whether you want a deep enriching experience or are just cheesing it to world 10, you're catered to in some form, even if not all of these styles are executed perfectly. If you like puzzle or action levels, you can do one of them for the entire playthrough. If you want a higher challenge, there's the score system and the advanced mode. Everyone gets something out of this game. Except for politicians, probably, I don't know. The only restriction I would note is you can't go too casually, as to unlock the next world, you do need to spend a certain amount of allers to unlock it. I found these to be pretty fair prices for the most part, maybe a bit on the easier side actually. The only world I even had to grind some other levels to unlock was maybe world 10. Although worlds aren't the only thing you could spend your hard earned money on, you can also buy avatars at the in-game store. I've already talked about the base controls, but I think I should talk about some of the other mechanics a bit. Typing works pretty smoothly, although it's important to remember that the DS does not have a multi-touch screen, meaning it's not like sending a text where you can type a few letters at a time on your phone. You do have to enter one letter per press. An understandable limitation, not really the game's fault. There are also a ton of other symbols and letters, which like, I, I don't know, I didn't use any of these once, but I can see from a technical perspective why they would have to be there. For some reason, they also added a self-write mode. I'm gonna be honest, I, I don't even really like the idea of this. It's super slow, but the more important issue with it, it, it just doesn't work. I couldn't even write the letter A. It would always think it was something else, but also, if you lift your stylus up for too long, and I mean like a quarter of a second, it would read the letter too early. Now tell me, do any of you write the letter A without lifting up your hand to draw the line in the center? It would be pretty impressive if you didn't, and don't get me started on letters like T or Q. But even when you do write a letter in one, it doesn't work anyway. Yeah, just don't use this. There's really no point. But it's literally slower, even if it worked. The in-game mechanics are pretty solid, although they can be a little bit clunky. Some objects you can interact with. Bombs, switches, stuff like that, all fun and good. But when you interact with it to trigger it, you have to stay the entire time for Maxwell's animation to finish out. Even though the game gives you full control to leave without indication of when you could walk away. Alright, this is frustrating for two reasons. For one, in the heat of an action level, you typically just want to keep moving, meaning waiting around can be kind of a death sentence, but also it's really hard to judge the window for when you can actually move. Something like a meter or like the stamina bar, and I don't mean like an actual stamina bar, I mean something that looked like that, it, it could have gone a long way. There have been times where I swore it was long enough, but I would go back and check and the object wasn't triggered. 
and that made me triggered. An object like a ladder would often feel a bit weird too. To climb it, you can't just click it. You have to press a second button titled climb. Not a huge deal, but kind of breaks up the fluidity of the game. The worst controls I think this game has is the shovel. I hated when this game made you dig. It's never really clear where exactly you have to press. You can't just click the dirt. You have to have some sort of distance where you tap. I never got used to this and it sucks because a lot of the action levels have some element of digging. The weapons in this game kind of suck too. It pulls a breath of the wild by having weapons that die out quicker than you can blink. Although it is way worse than Breath of the Wild, don't get me wrong. The standard gun, for instance, which is convenient to take out enemies, and trust me, there will be a lot of moments you need it, it only has three bullets. I can understand having some sort of a limit due to the par system, but three is just so little, man. In a combat section, it basically just means you have to waste your par on it. Things like swords and knives can fare a bit better, but you don't always have the luxury of melee combat. Overall, though, the game and its many mechanics work fine. There's definitely some clunky elements to it, especially in the 2009 release, but it's nothing terrible. It's nothing that you can't adapt to, especially if you make the effort to get good at it. And hey, the graphics are stellar. Don't get me wrong, there's tons of DS jank, and it's very noticeable and even a bit pixelated. But look, you have to give it some leeway considering the hardware and the time it was released. I actually really enjoyed the simple cartoony art style they went for with this game. I think a lot of early DS games tried really, really hard to be like N64 games or even GameCube titles. I'm thinking like Mario 64, or even like Phantom Hourglass, games like that. And nowadays, they don't look that good, but still not being a simple 2D platformer. I mean, it doesn't look great, but it's a lot more appealing to the eyes in 2022. And the music, oh man, this is so catchy. It's kind of like a beatbox pop fusion. I, I think I just gotta let it speak for itself here. There's even a level editor in this game, which, you know, it exists. It's a bit limited, but I would say the biggest downside is there's no one line in this game. While I can forgive this for the time, I would say this mostly kills any long-standing replay value this game would have. You can even unlock the merits, as I mentioned earlier, this game's kind of achievement system for being creative, another type of reward to benefit the player. Final level takes us to all the game developers. They want you to write the answer, and hey, I played those impossible quizzes every day in the 2010s. You can't fool me, all right, developers? They fight, you get a star right, and you complete a flawed, but really great an innovative game. I think Scribblenauts is a gem. I mean, it's not the most intuitive game at times, but it's a solid product and there's a lot of reasons to go back to it. I think my biggest issue was they had this great game mechanic and the potential just was never fully tapped with this title. So something like a sequel would have gone along the way. And thankfully they agreed, because they made a sequel a year later. What is this, Pokemon? Super Scribble Knots! Everything used to be Super, Super Mario, Super Nintendo, Super Monkey Ball, Super Noah's Ark 3D! Yeah, so Super Scribble Knots was a pretty good title for a sequel. I much prefer this to Scribble Knots 2 or something, because this game is actually a legitimate expansion and really builds upon the original. I'm gonna cut to the chase with this one. I love Super Scribble Knots. This is how you do a sequel. I think they almost did everything right with this game, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that. There's a lot reused from the first game, sure, but I like that because they made it so much better. The graphics are basically the same, the notebook controls in a similar fashion, and has all the same words, the menus, UI, all that's still here, but what they did was beef this game up and really fix the flaws of the original Scribblenauts. This game's main selling point was that now you can apply adjectives to your objects. This adds a whole new layer of depth and creativity to the game. Pretty much every adjective you can think of, just like the nouns, will work. To express this on the box art, they show Maxwell riding a winged dotted bathtub, something so wild and weird, but at the same time so appropriate for what this game actually is. You can either add an adjective now by typing it with the actual word, or even walking up to the object, tapping it, and writing it out to give it that modification. 
Starting the game up, Super Scribble Knots takes a huge leap over the original by getting rid of the 11 level tutorial world. At first when writing this, I was like, eh, maybe I'm being too harsh on the tutorial, maybe I shouldn't critique it in this section, but this pretty much validated that, yeah, the 11 level tutorial, get rid of it, do not pass go, do not collect $500. Now the tutorial level is one level, but condenses just about everything you need to know in a much, much quicker time. If you played the first game already, you pretty much already know what to do. The best thing about Super Scribble Knots are that the levels are leagues better, at least in my opinion, than the levels in the first Scribble Knots games. Gone are the weird levels that you would just cheese. I think I used the jetpack maybe like twice throughout my entire playthrough, and I don't even know if I had to do the rope trick at all. The black hole now actually just kills uh, everything. And you know what? I used to like this item, but I appreciate them going out of their way to remove something so exploitable. One function that you'll find yourself using a lot more here is the magnifying glass. Sure, you would use this in the original too, but with this game, not only is it good to decipher what the hell something is, but I found it would often expand my vocabulary and give me new words to put in my arsenal. And since this game is more puzzle-based, it was a real treat. Some of my favorite levels are the ones where there's like a bunch of empty squares and you're tasked with filling in the blanks. These can be as simple as adding an adjective to an existing object. Sometimes you play sort of a bingo. My favorite one of these is level 910. Here you're supposed to make three animals to win two bingos, looking for specific properties in each animal to spawn. This would be a good time for the beef coon to exist. Anyone, anyone know the beef coon? I love levels like this, there's a lot of them too, and some levels will have you using the robust adjective system to make oxymorons, like connecting a dummy with a professor by making them smart. These are really funny. What's really interesting is like, Maxwell isn't even needed for a lot of the levels in this game, you're gonna be using a touchscreen to scroll from like 30 miles away and just place items in. I still appreciate having the character there, you may as well, although it's funny to see him in like a box or something when all this crazy shit is going off there, but you're just chilling. You're kinda like a god. Par system is now completely gone. Instead Instead, you gain a flat rate of allers for finishing a level. These are no longer used to unlock the world, the game does that automatically now in shapes of constellations, but instead allows one of my favorite changes to this franchise. You can pay to unlock hints, which is a really helpful system. Because look, these levels can be tricky, alright? Even with the hints, I definitely had to look up the solutions to a level here or there, but the hints definitely make this game a lot more friendly and solvable without having to constantly be on Google if you can't figure something out. And the hints aren't always easy to figure out though, so it's not like it solves the level for you, you still have to do some external thinking. I still have the issue where the adjectives a solution needs can be a bit tricky. Here they want you to create a caveman similar to the above dinosaurs. The terms Steel Caveman and Rocky Caveman don't work, even though visually that's what I saw. I don't think the pool of words is unworkable or anything. It'd be nice if like multiple pairs of eyes would have different solutions. You know, get a big pool of possible ideas because I feel like it's just a one developer and they just have a few ideas for it and that's, that's it. That's all you can do. This game still kinda does the puzzle and action thing, but hey, the action levels are only 20 levels now. They're more like bonus worlds. Good riddance, get out of my damn face. All jokes aside, I would say the action levels are still mostly fine. I mean, you know what you're getting into now if you played the first game, alright? That game kicked you in the balls and made you a tiger! They have a much heavier focus on buttons and switches, but to be honest, it was kind of just a return to my old tricks. You see, that's the problem with these levels. They're just so easy to cheese. You can't make action levels with unlimited possibilities from a notebook. Some guy from Reddit's gonna find something dumb to do. And hey, you may have heard of jetpacks. But my friend, have you heard of fast jetpacks? <laughs> Puzzle levels are the star of the show here, no doubt in my mind, and as said before, they're really creative and well done. This is basically what I wish the first game was. There's a good amount of parodies here. You got James Bond, you got Wizard of Oz, and even a Super Mario Brothers level. I love this one a lot because the first game had a duck hunt level, so I'm pretty sure this is just a really clever callback to the double cartridge for the NES. There's a few experimental levels too. There's one where you have a list of clues and you have to decipher with facts and logic which kid belongs to which house. I kinda didn't like this. You have to click the paper like a hundred times unless you write it down. That's kind of meta, having a pen and paper out while playing scribble nuts. A lot of the mechanics have been refined too. Guns have unlimited ammo now. You can just tap on a ladder to climb it. Society has been saved. I even think they adjusted the time it takes to activate a switch or a bomb, but that like might be in my head. I don't know, I kind of just felt it, but I'm not 100% sure. The game even concludes with a charming boss fight where you take all the star rights you receive throughout the game and chuck them at evil Maxwell. This caught me off guard, honestly, because this whole game is like, huh, what, what words? should I use? Then all of a sudden, they slap you in the face, you're playing a 2D shooter. Evil Maxwell crashes, killing the star, right? And just like the first game, you gotta type it again to revive it. So yeah, I have nothing but good things to say about Super Scribble Knots. It's a damn good title. 
all the pauses from the first game right here and then some. You still got the amazing graphics and music, so I don't really need to go over that again. It's basically the same, if not better. Level Editor has been massively improved, now allowing for more interactability with puzzles, although I still don't think there's any online, which feels like a missed opportunity, but whatever. The merit system is back, and the adjective system and level refinement makes Super Scribble Notes a serious winner. And I'd go so far as to say, this is one of the best DS titles that wasn't made by Nintendo. I have to be honest here, your Super Scribble Knots kind of just makes the first game entirely irrelevant to play, unless you're just curious about it. I know I joked about this earlier, but it kind of reminds me of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl versus Pokemon Platinum. Like, I know Scribble Knots OG has different levels, but every aspect of it is seriously just so much better in Super Scribble Knots. And as said, it should be noted they did release a dual pack of both Scribble Knots on the DS together. In 2013, this was two years after the 3DS came out, I don't understand. And sure enough, like I alluded to earlier, Scribblenauts would find its way to iOS in 2011 and Android a few years later, and this makes perfect sense, as phones have built-in keyboard systems, and unlike the DS, multiple touches on the screen work at once, making for a much, much smoother experience. But I gotta be honest with you guys, alright? I only recorded a few worlds of gameplay here. While screen recording on my iPhone, my phone would get, like, really really hot and i'm not talking about like a little bit i'm talking like burning <laughs> so i hope you understand i do like youtube but it's not it's not worth blowing up my phone although anyway most of the game is just a collection of the levels from the ds titles so you and i are not missing that much while i still find the game a bit tough to control with the phone it works for the most part really well some mechanics were stripped such as adding an adjective to an already placed object which is kind of just like why did you take that out? I also gotta really commend the game for its price and content. Upon release, it was five bucks. Nowadays though, this game is a smooth 99 cents and there's even DLC. It's only $1 and you unlock 120 more levels. Oh my goodness. Now, of course, these are the prices nowadays. It was more expensive at the time, but if you want a Scribblenauts experience without buying a DS or something, this is a really good way to do it. It's the biggest draw to the iOS game in my opinion. It's an insanely good deal and cuts out the need to even have to buy a DS. And yeah, I'm recommending a phone game on this channel. I know, what's next? I'm gonna recommend a PC game or something? Some of the bells and whistles are missing. You can't easily move the camera around. At least I couldn't figure it out. I think there is a way. And some of the DLC is still annoying. You have to pay $1 for costumes now, which isn't that expensive, but feels a bit off as opposed to the $1 you could spend instead for 120 levels. One thing I really don't like about this game is the hint system. Instead of being able to use allers, you now just have to wait around. But the weird part is you can't just wait. You have to wait outside of any menus. So it's not like you can just ponder while trying to type things. I think it'd be a little better if the time you spent in menus counted. I get wanting to try to figure it out by yourself. I need to take a bath after saying what I'm about to say, but this would have been a really good opportunity to have, you know, like allers you could buy in the store because it wouldn't be required but would just be a nice bonus I, I don't know it's fine it's just way inferior and they use this for every scribble nuts game going forward so uh, get used to it if you don't like it it sucks and as i said earlier scribble nuts remix does mostly contain super scribble nuts levels i think there's a few og scribble nuts levels too and i actually remember seeing a few originals out of the worlds i played but if you've already played scribble nuts and super scribble nuts there's not anything too substantial here for you unless you just want to replay it the value in 2022 is substantial 170 levels for two bucks that's 17 worlds but i have a depressing prediction i feel like they're just like gonna remove this like a day after i make this video and it's just gonna like age the whole video instantly like it's gonna happen i know it okay mobile games go down all the time so if you want this game buy it like now i'm not even sponsored by them but i seriously recommend you do it the only downside to this is that it's a digital game. Mobile phone games are not known for lasting forever. Companies delete their products for uh, reasons. So if you even have a little interest, I seriously recommend buying this as soon as possible. Fifth Cell could just wake up tomorrow and say, Fuck it, take it down. I mean, even console games do that now. We are so screwed. Scribblenauts Remix concludes what I like to call the classic era of Scribblenauts, which feels weird to say because this series was really only active for four consecutive years, 2009 to 2013. I think the reason I feel this way, though, is because 2011 would be the last time Scribblenauts would be seen in this kind of crude style the series started with. And yes, the year was 2012. There are two main things I remember this year. The end of the world and the Wii U. That might just count as one thing, I don't know. I've talked about the Wii U 
countless times on this channel and so have many other YouTubers. But basically, what you need to know is that this console was a complete failure. You know that by now. Everyone go buy a Switch. I was one of the six people who actually bought this thing at launch and the game selection, while more robust than I think I've seen people give it credit to, didn't have a lot of immediate system sellers. But there was one title that in my heart that I knew was going to be good but slept on because I grew up with all the Scribblenauts games. And so when I saw Scribblenauts Unlimited, the series first HD title, <laughs> this is a match made in heaven. The Wii U gamepad was meant for this series and it finally meant that this series could have a place to shine. It also came out on the 3DS and iOS. Shh, I want to pretend like the Wii U mattered at all, okay? Now I gotta complain. I am recording this on the Scribblenauts Mega Pack re-release, which packaged this and Scribblenauts Unmasked, the next game, together for modern consoles. These are inferior versions of the game in my opinion, but I don't own a Wii U right now, so this was the most convenient way for me to capture footage. Despite these games being worse than the Wii U versions, I'm gonna talk about the Mega Pack changes after. For now, I wanted to focus on the game itself and not let the flaws of the re-release distract from that. Anyways, this is the first Scribblenauts game to get a story, and there's a voice acting. Can pigs fly? Well, yeah, I guess. I guess they can. It's scribble nuts. We learn about Maxwell's parents, Edgar and Julie, who had 42 kids, apparently. Maxwell's one of them, of course, and we're introduced to Sister Lily, who gets her focus for the first time in the franchise and would eventually become a mainstay, even getting added to Scribblenauts Remix as DLC. We gotta talk about the elephant in the room. So we see Maxwell, right? He has quite a particular design that we haven't talked about up to this point, mainly his head. I legitimately thought until this game that he just had like a weird haircut and beard that connected with each other, like kind of like a degen or something. It was just like a redhead. But uh, yeah, what, a what about Lily? Because I don't, I don't think she's growing a beard. Also, this game has you create something similar to you at one point, and the solution to the puzzle is a rooster. So yeah, I played the whole series up to this point, living a goddamn lie. There was even a girl version of Maxwell lost in the code for the first two Scribblenauts games, also with the chicken hat, so I assume this was the beta design for Lily or something, and I really like Lily. I think it's necessary to have a second character, and it's nice to see the Scribblenauts roster gain another mainstay. So Maxwell's gifted his magic notebook that allows him to make cheese at a given notice, and Lily is given a globe that lets her travel wherever she wants. As I'm sitting here getting ready for a plane ride writing this? That sounds nice. How do I get that? Maxwell creates a rotten apple for an old guy, and the old man turns Lily into stone. That's really stupid. Like, Lily did not deserve that. Why let Maxwell run free, and his sister has to suffer for his action? What is he, a politician? I already made that joke in this video, didn't I? It's still relevant. His farmer brother, Edwin, says to undo the curse, he has to go get a bunch of star rights, and... Yeah, this story's not mind-blowing, but I do like that it's not overly simple. I think this sets up the game quite nicely. Like, for a Scribblenauts story, I didn't really know what to expect, I guess. But you know me, I haven't liked the Sonic stories since Sonic Heroes, so I'm probably not the person to ask about stories in video games. <laughs> the game starts, and god damn, does this game look great. Okay, after seeing Scribblenauts 1 and Super Scribblenauts, looking good style-wise, but, you know... Their DS games, Scribblenauts Unlimited on an HD TV, is nothing short of breathtaking. I mean, maybe it's just like getting out of a tunnel and seeing the light. I did just spend 20 hours playing Scribblenauts DS games, but I don't care. Scribblenauts has never looked better. And whether you binge the series up to this point, like I have, or you grew up with the first few and then got Unlimited, uh, also, like I have, you gotta admit, this is breathtaking. It's like a modern cartoon that you can interact with. The backgrounds are super detailed, and while I could tell all the models are still probably reused assets, they look really crisp. It's very easy to distinguish what's in the foreground or background. It's a wonderful presentation. There's tons of worlds here, too. Like, sure, you got your classics, desert, water, etc., but there's some really unique ones here, too. You got your in depth city that lets you go into buildings like a hospital, fire station, there's things like space stations. Obviously, nothing too new for the franchise, but what makes Scribblenauts Unlimited different from the older games is that the level system from the past is completely gone in favor of a living, breathing world. There are still some of the normal levels. You could interact with an object that has a starite floating over its head, and it's the classic Scribblenauts experience, more or less. I will say, though, some of these levels are a lot longer. I like the longer levels, most of them are good experience, but for hell's sake, this game really needed some checkpoints. Basically, it doesn't matter where you die, even if it's at the very end of the level, 
you need to start all over again. Yup, it's one of those games. I don't always mind that for, like, platformers or games that require inherent skill. There's something to be respected with an entire clean run. But for Scribblenauts, it's really pointless not to have checkpoints. Like, I already solved the damn puzzle, so it's just busy work to get back there. I already solved the damn puzzle, so yup, let me just let me just enter it again. You can either do the main star rights, or you can do what I think is one of the best additions to the franchise. Little bite-sized puzzles. Each one gives you a tenth of a star right. These are typically one or two sentence objectives, and while it's not always clear what an NPC wants, it's typically pretty easy to figure out. Since these are shorter, as I said, you only get one tenth of a star right piece, but they add up fairly quickly, so they are worth your time. To unlock the ending of the game, it's like 60 star rights total or something, so you'll need to do a little bit of both, I believe. But overall, there's nearly double that number in the game. There is quite a bit of content in this game to experience, per usual, in this franchise. And hey, if you help out one of Maxwell's companions, you can usually tell if they have the weird chicken hat that I still haven't accepted yet as a hat and not a beard, you could actually get that character to play as them. A nice touch, and more gratifying, in my opinion, than just buying random avatars you have no connection to in a store. Virgin now spawns a wife. Uh, you guys are freaking cowards. I think one thing this game has over the first few games is there's a certain element and a polish that just hasn't been seen in the series up to this point. There's screams and voices, <clears throat> and even little things like spawning the general now has a 50-50 chance to either give you a male or female character, something I think is a really nice touch, as in the old games, it would just be one model. There are still some glitches and weird things, sure, like I don't know why these UI buttons stayed on screen throughout this entire level, for instance, while even starting a mission. Some puzzles are still jank. Here the teacher wanted me to write letters on the board. Okay, here's some there's some letters for you, I guess. But overall, this is by and large the most polished and in-depth Scribblenauts game. On the Wii U, you can even create Mario and Zelda characters. They didn't transfer this to the Switch version, though, which is a bit disappointing, especially comparing to LEGO City Undercover. Those Easter eggs did make the cut. But hey, I get it. You supported the Wii U. I can't blame you if you're a little salty at Nintendo still. I, I haven't moved on, that's for sure. And the re-release was on PS4 and Xbox as well, so they're probably just a bit lazy with it. That's, that's the real reason. There's also an object creator. I have no creativity, so I didn't spend too much time on it myself, but it's very in-depth. The things that people have created with this are insanely good. You can upload these items online and search for them in a mall-like search engine, which is kind of weird, honestly, but it has some charm to it at least. Thankfully, this place does seem to be moderated. I did search, uh, like, some, you know, terms just to be safe, and yeah, there are safety measures, thankfully. I didn't find anything concerning, so thank God for that. O overall, it's a really nice addition to the game that provides a ton of value, and you can even search for your own items and downloaded items in the notebook while playing the damn game. There's no level creator now, so it's kind of a weird trade-off. This would have been nice considering the online functionality, but now if you search level editor in notebook, they turn it into a joke. It just spawns a computer. F you. You're free, Lily. Everyone's happy. There's no final level here since it's just about getting 60 star rights, but honestly, there's a lot of incentive to go back and get the other 60. You know why? Because this game is fun. So Scribblenauts Unlimited, I think, is probably the best Scribblenauts game, but I do sometimes wonder to myself, and I don't know if this is going to be a hot take or not, do I like Super Scribblenauts more? I don't know what it is. I think I had a little more fun with Super Scribblenauts. I think Objectively Unlimited is the better game, so I'm not making some absurd statement. It's just an opinion. But I think personally, I kind of just prefer the approach of just being given a puzzle in a concentrated area, and I think levels might work a bit better for this franchise, but both are amazing games, and I had a blast with each of them. I can't recommend one or the other. Get both. And hey, Unlimited's also on mobile. As I said, it's $5 instead of a dollar, but that is a steal regardless and a really easy way to play it. So at this point, the series was at an all-time high, as games at least. Commercially, of course, with the Wii U being a failure, Unlimited didn't sell that well. Only about 380,000 according to VG Charts, which is interesting because the game I compare this to often is LEGO City Undercover. Both were child-friendly games that were a genuine third-party support for this failing console and exclusives at the time, both from somewhat well-known series, although LEGO is obviously LEGO. Both had a Nintendo crossover too, so if I had to guess, the launch lineup in general just kind of buried this game completely. No one really talked about it. And LEGO City basically having its own time and period without any competition, well, it would lead to more direct promotion from Nintendo. The question for Scribblenauts would be, what's next for this series' future? If there was one. After all, the series up to this point had yearly releases if you count Scribblenauts Remix. Well, 2013 would lead us to our next game, Scribblenauts Unmasked, a collaboration between Scribblenauts and the DC Universe. 
Uh, this is basically DLC for Unlimited that they sold for 40 bucks at retail. Yeah. All right, look, I don't have too much positive to say about this game. I, I just... I just don't like it. I don't think it's objectively, like, horrible, but as someone who bought this at launch and even gave it another shot for this review, it just doesn't feel like that good of a product. Like, sure, you got the normal Scribblenauts notebook and items you can spawn, only now you can spawn DC Universe characters, items, and adjectives, which is pretty impressive, but like, I don't know, the feel of the game and the Scribblenauts charm is just missing. It's just not there. Maxwell talks now, which is really off-putting to me. Maxwell is a silent protagonist. I kind of viewed him as like a Mario or a Link type of guy, so seeing him talking out of nowhere is just like... Ugh. I actually thought about this, and I think in part Maxwell was better when he didn't speak, because he was supposed to be like, well you, the player, he felt kind of like a godlike role in this universe. And this completely just breaks that immersion. Also, what is that smile? Get that away from me! I think the biggest problem is, sure, the entire DC universe is present, but it's not utilized that well. And it really couldn't be. Take this situation. Superman is fighting Lex Luthor, classic DC shenanigans, but it's like, they can't really make the situation unique to the DC universe, otherwise people like me, and just people who don't care for superhero stuff in general, they, they wouldn't be able to like, play it. So, dragging Lex Luthor out of the building has us doing the old rope and glue technique. Like, okay, this is just Scribblenauts 1 stuff with a fresh coat of paint. Superman here needs a melee weapon. Have you ever just seen Superman use a fucking sword? I looked it up and there's some like, old comic where Superman does have a sword, but like, that's not what Superman does. He has like laser vision. He has super strength. But yeah, here you're just like, here's a here's a sword. Why don't we give Mario a gun or Sonic the Hedgehog handcuffs? Like it's just not the character. Speaking of comics, Scribblenauts in DC would actually pair up to create a series of comic books. All new adventures based on the smash hit video game. So I'm not a comic critique or anything, but I'll try to go over it the best I can with a casual eye. The comic itself reminds me of a more concentrated Where's Waldo in what I read. What I mean by that is that there is so much to look at in each page. It's really fun. Each panel presents itself with so many characters and so much art. There's a lot of heart and soul put into these drawings. I really dig them. I like how they incorporated elements of scribble knots too. When a character expresses an emotion, they get the symbol bubble the same way they would in the game, which is a cute reference to the source material. Material. Some panels even look like straight-up Scribblenauts levels. Gotham, being one of the main hub worlds for Unmasked, is pretty much recreated one from one here. Or they just took the files from the game and pasted it. I don't know. Oh my god, this guy's handwriting is impact font! That's the most impressive superpower I've ever seen! So I've been calling him Evil Maxwell throughout this video. He's actually called the Doppelganger, and he's a central antagonist in both the game and the comic book. Here, we're also introduced to Doppel Lily. I love this. She was technically in the Unmasked game, but like at the very end of the game or something, but overall, I'm all for expanding the Scribblenauts world and lore a bit. And I'm actually kind of surprised how much the comic focuses on Maxwell. Sometimes there's a lot of panels just for him and Lily, and the superheroes are nowhere to be seen. I still don't really like how Maxwell talks, I guess in a comic book setting it's a bit more fair, as the aspect of the character being a god in control of his environment is not really as important, but after playing the series for so many years, it's still just something I can't get past. There are 18 books in the series, so I couldn't read them all for this video. Mainly, I just read some samples here or there, but from what I have read, I honestly like them more than the game, and I might check out the whole series at some point. I think they have so much more personality and charm that was straight up missing in the video game. I guess while we're on this topic, there was also some other merchandise for the Scribblenaut series. Nothing too crazy, but there were your standard ones, like a plushie, there was a bobblehead sort of thing, but the funniest thing to me at least is that the Maxwell chicken hat that was actually a pre-order bonus. Now listen, I don't know who designs this stuff, but who the hell is gonna wear that? You'd be the laughing stock of the town. Chickens would make fun of you. Imagine going down the street wearing the chicken hat, going to a bank, going on a date, you'd be a social pariah! Apparently this guy in the fandom wiki seems to agree, saying that a kid wearing this at his school would probably get a beating before he could walk in. Yeah, you know what, he probably would. Response says that these days someone can be beat up for eating an apple. What? Hey punk, are you eating an apple? Come here you little sh I'm gonna beat you up.
Unmasked also introduces an interesting system where reusing words will now reduce the amount of points you can win by solving something, which kind of presents itself as an interesting way to keep things fresh, but it does feel like a band-aid solution. Now, I often find myself entering something like, I don't know, just different variations of guns or knives if I need a weapon, so I feel like it really doesn't solve that much, and it's more so to disguise the fact that the puzzles aren't as creative. Max will also has a punch now by pressing B. Did I mention this game lost all the scribble knots charm? I'm just gonna say it again. This really should've just been a $10 add-on for Unlimited. Like, sure, there is an acceptable amount of content, but a lot of it is padded. The mini puzzles do return, but they're like auto-generated now instead of being genuinely thought out and planned and you can get repeats. It feels a little lazy. They do this so you can unlock certain amounts of points to unlock other environments. So there does need to be a steady supply of them, and some of them do DC type of things. Like, here, this girl needs Superman. But like, okay, the solution to the puzzle is I just type Superman. What was the point of that? And there's just a lot of fetch quests in comparison to Unlimited. Sure, Unlimited and the other games had a few, but sometimes you spawn a level and there's like five people who are like, yep, bring me this. Yep, I always wanted to play a damn Scribblenauts platformer. Yep, take away what makes the game good, right? Well, bust out the old jetpack. Like, this game just falls back on a lot of the faults and repetitive nature of the first game. To make matters worse, Lily sometimes just asks you if you want to go to another world or refresh your current one. And it's like, I'm in the middle of something here. Can you, can you give me a minute? It's like the text box is in Pac-Man World 2 on GBA. Let me play the damn game. Like, I figured at first this wouldn't happen in the heat of an action, at least. But nope, it doesn't matter, because it can happen rain or damn shine. It's like a five-minute timer or something, and it really destroys the pace of the game. Let me enjoy the world. I haven't even gotten a chance to talk to every NPC, Lily. And I will clarify that I'm honestly not that big of a DC Universe guy. Nothing against it, really. I'm just more of a Marvel person. And the DC universe has not been executed that well in the modern day and age, so maybe that's kind of skewing it for me. As I said, it's more of a coat of paint than a genuine mechanic. It's a step back for the series. That might be a little harsh, but it feels like Scribblenauts 1 again with DC characters and text boxes. If this was DLC, I really think I'd be praising it, but the fact that this is a standalone game and the last original physical release this franchise has gotten is really sad. To make matters worse, there's only like 12 main star rights to collect in this game. Now that is pathetic. Think back to the first game, which had over 100 levels. And I didn't make it all the way through this game, to be honest. But the star rights I did play were barely longer than some of them in Unlimited. So you mainly just do the auto-generated stuff to progress. And this whole game is padding and didn't need to exist. This is kind of where the Skrill Nuts franchise, I don't want to say died... There were a few projects that ultimately were in development but got cancelled. The first of these was a 3D Scribblenauts game concept. I don't think it was super far in development. What we have of it is pretty much just a demonstration. Of course, it's only a concept, but instead of a notebook now, you have the ability to choose from a variety of weapons in a menu. The game developers were worried that on the fly it would be too difficult to really execute the notebook. To an extent, I don't even think this looks like a Scribblenauts game. Like, sure, you got Maxwell, you got some animals that kind of resemble the in-game art, but it feels like the type of project that would have shifted to probably an entirely new game with development pushed forward. It's really hard to critique this fairly, it's not a finished product at all. It is an interesting footnote nonetheless. There's even some gameplay too, although I don't know how far of a build this is or if it's just concept work, but it looks like a beat-em-up. And also the black hole is back. If I had 100 bucks for every Scribblenauts game that's been cancelled, I'd have 200 bucks, I'd be able to afford a gallon of gas. Yup, there was another one. This one actually made it to a beta stage and would have been another mobile game named Scribblenauts Fighting Words. I freaking love that title. That's so good. I guess I forgot to mention this in my unlimited portion of the video, but around this time is when Fifth Cell started making puns related to the words. Every world in that game was a reference, like Metaphorist. It was another charming aspect of Scribblenauts that's mostly been forgotten by now. Anyways, it's tough to say exactly what this game would have been. I don't know, it doesn't look like anything super interesting. You run up to enemies, enter a word, and, and fight. We? It's tough for me to look at this and be like, yeah, this is this is a great use of the franchise, because it's, it's really not. I mean, Scribblenauts is Scribble not the type of game to really benefit from a different or experimental gameplay formula. It just feels off to me. But this time, this game wasn't cancelled based off of the idea. Unfortunately for our good friends at Fifth Cell, they would fire 45 employees around this time. And for reference, their 2021 numbers are 25. That's kind of a big deal. And Fifth Cell's games around this time were just not coming to fruition. They had another cancelled game unrelated to Scribblenauts too. It's really sad to think about it, but 
but it feels like Stribblenauts Unlimited was their swan song, and they were just never able to really bounce back and exist in the modern era. Was it because they could no longer get yearly releases on HD consoles like they could with handheld platforms? I struggle to say that's the cause of Scribblenauts could have totally been on 3DS for a bit, and then eventually like iOS and PC. Like sure, most gaming platforms wouldn't have been the most friendly for it, but when those options existed, I just don't think we can say that's why the series died. I think it's because they just didn't know what direction to take the series after Unmasked and Unlimited. You have to remember, this is a game company that never wanted to sell out. They never wanted to make the same thing over and over. They wanted to innovate and keep pushing their products forward. And I imagine there was a lot of internal arguing and disagreements, although obviously it's all speculation for me. But while Fifth Cell died around this time, well, Scribblenauts itself would not. Not technically, at least. The franchise would get passed off to some new faces, a shiver entertainment. <sighs> Here. The first thing Shiver Entertainment would do with this franchise is make Scribblenauts Showdown. Oh, come on, this name sucks. I would've just taken fighting words. That was so good, and this is just generic. You may as well just name it like Scribblenauts Reloaded or something. I actually haven't played this one before this review. I've actually played every Scribblenauts game before this at or near launch up to this point. I didn't even know this game out. Like, no one talked about it. So, uh, let's, let's give it a chance. It, it, it could be good. It's not gonna be good. Why couldn't we use a Pro Controller? Why couldn't we use two Joy-Cons? Why were they so adamant about a single Joy-Con controller? For a Scribblenauts game, it does hurt the experience quite a bit. Well, the real reasoning for it is because this is a Mario Party clone. Oh, come on. Like all the things they could have done with this franchise, we get like mobile games, weird DLC type of experiences, half-baked ideas. It's not like the Scribblenauts series was out of juice. Just make a normal game. Well, there is a Scribblenauts type of mode called the Sandbox, but it's just really weird. I guess I'm glad they added it, but I don't know. It's not just a Sandbox, you can do missions, but the issue is, instead of talking to the NPCs to solve their puzzles, you're just given a list that applies to the whole area. You're gonna be pausing quite a lot. But you might ask, whoa, 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 Jeff, 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 how, slow down, man. How do you spawn objects without a touchscreen? A valid concern, of course. This is the first Scribblenauts game without one. It's on the PS4, Xbox One, and Switch. And no, you can't take your Switch out of the dock and type on it, at least in Showdown. Well, instead, they added, like, a rotary dial? I'm not gonna lie, I would have just preferred a basic type screen, or at least have the option for one. If you want to see something ass backwards to erase, they didn't put the B button as backspace. Oftentimes, I press B out of habit because that's what I'm used to. This system does get easier over time, but I'll be honest, it still feels really shoehorned in and you never really get used to it. So you might have seen it on screen during the unlimited section, and yes, this is the workaround for the Scribblenauts Mega Pack that the same consoles would also receive a year later. So that's where I experienced this system the most. I should note that Mega Pack also received a PC version where you can type. So, okay, here's my advice. Throw all versions of this game in the trash that aren't the PC version, even though I'm mainly a console gamer. In this case, I have no choice but to succumb to the PC master race. Everyone throw your consoles away. You don't you don't need them, all right? Uh, there isn't too much to say about Mega Pack besides the controls. There's some minor adjustments and even new levels, which, you know what? I didn't even know they were new until I looked it up, so I actually thought it was just a part of the game. So they actually did a pretty good job in terms of integrating new content. And hey, they added new content, period, putting another remake above Mario 3D All-Star. Anyways, the rotary dial sucks beyond just, uh, you know, existing, because now you can't add adjectives to one word. Like, if you try to search atrocious video game, you have to first type video game and then atrocious separately. If you can't tell by my my brilliant humor, this game's atrocious. Part of the fun of Super Scribblenauts was typing it all in one go, seeing how crazy of a creation you can make. But nope, we're taking that away. This also leads to issues with things like ropes. Moving is now a completely separate mechanism, which works fine, but the ropes and tape and things that require you to mess with that are basically impossible to do anywhere near how you could in the DS version. Instead of tapping on objects now, you simply press the B button to activate it and shuffle through them with the control pad. Like, sure, there are workarounds with this new control scheme, it's playable. But just by the PC version, like, honestly, at least you can use a keyboard and mouse there. Showdown doesn't have a PC version, so we're kind of fucked. Yeah, these hub worlds are really bad. I appreciate the sentiment, alright? I appreciate them trying to have something Scribblenauts related. But it's so half-assed and awkward that I really can't praise it beyond that. Especially because you have to use a single Joy-Con here. It's just so soulless. Like, it doesn't feel like Scribblenauts. You could tell a new developer made this. There's no heart and soul. Uh, yeah, the sad thing is, this is like 
by far the best part about this game. I'm not kidding. Yeah, this game's a Mario Party clone. You roll a dice, you have a bunch of cards, so maybe it's more of a Sonic Shuffle ripoff. Some of the mini games let you type a word, but the situations don't really present anything interesting. It's really more so a visual. There aren't any puzzles. You don't get rewarded with anything. Sure, there's a bit of a challenge in how you search a word. Sometimes it'll say, this has to start with a letter, or this needs to be steel, but it's not enough to make it interesting. But you want to know the real kicker? Not all the mini games even have the word mechanic. So you literally just play generic mini games with no scribble knots charm whatsoever. Like, I didn't like the words that much, but you gotta at least have that. It's a scribble knots game. Sure, the graphics look like fine. Eh, it kind of looks like a Flash game or something. It reminds me of Prop Tropica, and I can't believe I'm making that sort of reference here. The whole game just feels cheap. Some of the minigames are really shameless, too. They have either really simple premises, or in some cases, you have to use motion controls. Like, yep, let's just add another thing to the checklist of what makes a bad game. And there's not even online in this game. Like, at least have that. You're making a party game in 2018, but you don't even put online? What are you, Nintendo? Yeah, so this game came out in 2018, and besides the Mega Pack, uh, we've gotten pretty much nothing since then. I will say, both of these games are always on sale nowadays for usually pretty cheap. I bought both of these games on Switch for like five bucks. So listen, it's not the most noteworthy games to criticize. They're accessible and cheap, and it's harder for me to really want to yell at a product when it's that cheap. But I don't know, as a game series, Girl Nuts just feels kind of dead. To be honest, I don't see a future for this series. It's not a game that I really see a devote fan base for. I don't really see anyone talk about it or anyone wishing for it. It's not like people are like, Maxwell for Smash Brothers, yeah! I don't even know if this game would be profitable, and it's not even the original company and team behind it anymore, so it's not like they're gonna have the passion to make a new Scribblenauts game. Like, does anyone care? I think you can make another one of these with the PC or mobile crowds, but the downside of that is it's a pretty limited release and you don't capture most of the audience who grew up with it, something which I think is going to be a huge problem with a game like Rolled Out. Super Monkey Ball loves Nintendo consoles. How are you going to put that on PC only? But more importantly, the why I don't see it happening, I just don't think there's been any public interest shown in making a new game. I bet there are still fans out there, and likely this video will have a few people who say they want a new game, but is it enough for a new game to get the green light, and should it be a new developer if it happens? It's sad, but most of Scribblenauts was really good. Not every series has to live on forever. Things have expiration dates, and it seems like around 2012, 2013 was just the time for it to go. And they did try to revive it very briefly. I would love to see this series return, but I'm gonna be honest, it just feels very unlikely, and more unlikely than something like Monkey Ball when it was in its weird state. I would say though, Super Scribble Knots and Unlimited are serious hidden gems. Maybe not hidden, I mean, people kinda know about these games, but if you have an opportunity to play them, go for it. And hey, Unlimited's on PC and mobile, with a keyboard and mouse on PC, so you have no excuse, go buy it. All right, I have no funny outro today, let's just try this uh, magic notebook one more time. <laughs> Hello, I am Jeff Compass. If you liked the video, like it. If you didn't like the video, still like it. Make sure to subscribe. Make sure to follow me on Twitter. Make sure Listen, don't blame me for the self-promotion. Sure it's, it's on him. Make sure to download okay, it's his fault. Blame Jeff. Sure